Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Friday morning's thought for the day. I uh, hope you've had a good week so far, and uh, we reach the end of the week. The first week of our look at the uh, this little prophecy at the end of the Old Testament, Malachi. And um, we've seen this week that everything we've looked at comes from God's initial opening gambit, as it were. He's he sent his prophet to speak to his people, his beloved people who have wandered away from him and who aren't taking their worship of him seriously. They're dishonouring his name and uh, their lives, uh, they've kind of wandered away from, from, from uh, their true priority, which is making God the centre of everything that they do. And the reason they should do that is because God has chosen to love them. That's what we've been seeing all this week. And everything that we're, we've been looking at this week flows from that. And, and it, of course, it comes from uh, everything in our lives flows from that as well, doesn't it? Like the fact that God loves us. It's an amazing statement. It's not just a, a pithy little thing we can see on a card or something like that. This is, it matters. It's weighty. It means something. And we, we have to respond to that, don't we? And we see how these people have responded in, in Malachi's day where they've wandered away from God and they've kind of take, not taken God seriously enough, if you like. And it started to show in the way that they live their lives and in particularly how they come before him in worship. And yesterday we talked about them dishonouring God and particularly the priests, how they brought the sacrifices into the house of the Lord and how they led the people. Well, we're going to carry on with that today as we come to the end of this first week. So before we do that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity once again to come before your word and we ask that you would help us again, Lord. Give us ears to hear what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So towards the end of this chapter then, um, the heading for today is, is carrying on really from yesterday. Careless worship. Talking to the ordinary people perhaps now. Uh, in verse 13, um, God says to them, and you say, what a burden when, he, when God is calling them back. This is the thing, what God is doing here through Malachi is graciously calling his people back, giving them an opportunity to return to him and and reminding them of their responsibilities, if you like, or the, the need to respond to God's gracious love towards them. And, and he says, and then God says to them, well, what are you saying to me? What a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord God Almighty. And basically what, what that's saying is that they've become kind of weary of following God they've not really taken it seriously enough they've become flippant in their worship in the way they deal with God they take it or leave it God is it's been reduced to the level of other things in their lives in fact other things have become more important and in a sense that's the danger for all of us isn't it maybe God could be bringing this message to our church today or to us as individuals today um, are we becoming too familiar with the Lord's table and with the Lord's worship? Are we bringing him down a level or do we see God as the awesome God who loves us out of nowhere? And, and do we treat him with the, with the respect and the honour that he deserves? Do we honour him with our lips and in our ways as well? And I guess the question we asked yesterday and the question behind all of this this morning is, is God just getting what's left over? Do we do other things first? Are other things more important in our lives? Our work, our leisure, our families, everything else more important than God. And then God gets just what's left over, doesn't he? That's what God's accusation, if you like, was to these people. It was that their, their lack of understanding of God's love for them has led them to realise, led them to behave in this way. And somebody once said, we can become bored with our blessings we get so used to them that we don't appreciate just how wonderful this is how amazing it is that God should take us as people who have rejected him who are sinful people wicked people uh, in our hearts and have, has brought us back to himself what, a, what an amazing grace that is it's the, what inspires him writers like John Newton doesn't it amazing grace how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me he's got it he understands how awful his sin of walking away from God is and can't believe that God has brought him back and in a sense that's what God wants these people and us today to rediscover if you like God is graciously calling us back there's also a little bit of a warning here be careful that we don't cheapen anything of God at all that we don't make what God has done for us seem like very little we cheapen something of God we can do that quite easily because if we cheapen anything of God his church 
maybe a doctrine that somebody else talks about, a doctrine that's so important, a doctrine of election we talked about the other day, very difficult, and we cheapen it, we say, oh, it doesn't really matter, and we can just get flippant with it all. Perhaps we cheapen the scriptures, or as I say, the church, or even perhaps one of God's children, a brother or a sister in Christ. We cheapen their ministry, cheapen what they do. We have to be careful we don't cheapen the things of God, because if we do that, we cheapen God himself. That's an important message for us. And that's, in a sense, what these people had done. They cheapened the worship of God. So they thought it was perfectly OK to bring him the leftovers, the, not the best that they had, but just anything out of, you know, that they had to offer him. And, and that was their sin. This is what God has called them out for. We see here in ver the end of verse 13 and 14, uh, you do this when you bring injured, crippled or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices. Should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is, and this is a strong word again, God, it, some of these words God uses in this prophecy are very strong through the prophet. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord as if the God doesn't know. And that would be like us saying, Lord, we're going to give you the best. We're going to serve you. We love you. We sing all about you on Sunday. We think you're, the, you're marvellous. You're wonderful. We sing all these wonderful words. And then in the week, we hardly ever think about you. We hardly ever pray. We hardly ever read our Bible. We don't really pay you the attention that you deserve. And we discount you from all so much of our lives. That would be the equivalent, perhaps, for us today. We promise we bring these sacrifices to you. Uh, and we promise that we bring you the best that we've got. And actually, we don't do that. And so a, a real question for us this morning. Are we giving God our best? Is God our first priority? It goes back to what we've been saying all week, really. This is, we're going to come back to this again and again. This is what God desires of us. So are we giving the best hours of our day, the first hours of our day, perhaps, whatever the best hours are for you? Are we giving God the best of our day? He deserves that, doesn't he? He doesn't, not after we've finished work and just give him a bit of time again, he deserves the best hours of our day. We plan that first. We almost decide these are the hours I'm going to give God and the rest I'll give to work, family and everything else that needs to be done. But God gets my best. That's the attitude that God is calling for here. That's what true worship looks like. So the best years of my life. Am I going to serve God now in the best years of my life? Am I going to wait till there's nothing else to do and then I'll perhaps give God some time when I've got some time? A lot of people say, you know, I'm just building a career. I've got, I've got to get this, my, my career going. I've got to do all my studies. I've got to invest time in all of that. And then when I've done all of that, then God, you can have that. And then it's, oh, I've got to give the children all the time. So then I'll give God that. What, what is God getting our best? All these things are important. But God is not saying we should not do them. But are we planning how we give our time to God? The best years of our life, the best hours of our day, the best or the first out of our income. As God gives us graciously income, whatever we get, however rich or poor we are, does God get first considerate? How can I use this to please God in one way or another? The best energy of our body when we're strongest or do we wait till we're shattered at the end of the day or at the end of the week and then give that to God and then decide, well, we should be doing something and we perhaps feel a bit guilty or do we give him the best energy of our body, the best intellect of our mind when we're sharpest? Do we give him that? Or is he our first thought? These are really you know, strong questions, searching questions, aren't they? These are questions that I've asked myself on many occasions, the questions I was given by somebody else years ago and they've stood me in good stead over the years and many times I've felt co convicted by them by God speaking to me through them is it time we reconsidered our priorities is it time we thought through what is God getting my best or is he just getting the scrapings off my plate the leftovers does it cost anything there's a great story in the old testament where king david wants to uh, it, he was going to use the product of a field he bought. He wants to get off uh, Arona or whatever his name was. I can't pronounce the name. <laughs> in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 24, David says, no, I want to buy this field. I'll give you the going rate for it because, and he quote, I quote, I won't give God anything that costs me nothing. What a great sort of phrase to have maybe stuck to our fridge door or whatever it is we look. I will not give God anything that doesn't cost me anything at all. I will give God nothing that costs me nothing, if you see what I mean. That's the quote, isn't it, really? 
And that's what God wants from us. We have a desire that what I give to God will mean something. What God has given to us, his love, means something. It's weighty and therefore what we give back to him as much as we can in our worship has to do that too. We can't trick God, can we? He knows our heart. He knows what we're giving to him. And that's what he's saying here. You, you think you've got a, uh, you think I don't know that you're giving me not the best. And yet I do know. Uh, and so God understands where we're coming from. And there are times when we can give him more and there are times when we can give him less because of life and life circumstances. And God understands that because what he know, what he wants to see is what our heart's like. Are we just satisfied with being flippant with God and giving him what's left over? And so that's why we read in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul's injunction for us to live, to lay our lives on the altar of worship, of sacrifice, uh, to lay our lives down as an offering of worship. Hebrews 13 and verse 15, bringing a continual sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord daily, not just singing, but our whole lives, isn't it? And Hebrews 13, the next verse, verse 16, our, even our good works are an offering of praise to God. Everything we do, well, what a challenge as we come to the end of this week, isn't it, really? It's been a challenging week, really, isn't it? I started with saying, God saying to us, I have loved you unconditionally. What do we, how do we respond to that? What a glorious, gracious God we have. And our best response is where we've come to today is giving him everything that we have, giving him the best of what we have, the best of our hearts, the first. The, it's the principle right through scripture. It's the principle behind the tithing principle as well, but we haven't got time to go into that now this morning. So what a challenge. How will you respond to God's love today? I have loved you, says the Lord. How are we responding to him? And he deserves our worship our praise, laying our lives on the altar of sacrifice towards him. Let's pray together as we close, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today, this week, for this wonderful words that hear in this, in this prophetic word from the Old Testament. Lord, we pray that you would help us to apply them to our hearts, in our situation, that you would have our best, that you would be our priority, and that we'd recognise just how amazing the fact, that, the fact is that you love us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.